What's up everybody and welcome to part 8 of my basics of the blurring series. In the previous video we left off with the observation that if we want to apply the gradient descent algorithm to our cost function then we need to determine the partial derivative of the mean squared error with respect to weight matrix 1 and with respect to weight matrix 2. And this is what we want to do now. So as you can see however uh, our function here is quite complicated so Accordingly, determining those partial derivatives in just one step is also uh, going to be quite complicated. But fortunately, we don't have to do that in just one step because uh, this function here is made up of intermediate functions where we always put the result of one step into the next one. And this allows us to use the chain rule to determine those partial derivatives. So once again, let's look at a simpler function than our mean squared error to explain that concept. So let's say z is a function of y and y in turn is a function of x. Then the chain rule states if you want to determine the derivative of z with respect to x then you have to multiply the derivative of z with respect to y with the derivative of y with respect to x. So basically what you're doing in a chain rule is multiplying together the derivatives of those uh, functions. And intuitively this makes sense because if you slightly increase x then this will have an effect on y. And this effect on y in turn will have an effect on z. So if you want to know how z changes if you slightly increase x then it makes sense that you would uh, multiply together those two effects. And as a side note here we are using the regular derivative again because both of those functions only depend on one variable. Okay, so that's how the chain rule generally works and hereby it doesn't really matter how many functions there are to begin with because we can arbitrarily expand this formula. So let's say for example that x would be a function of v. So in that case then if you want to determine the derivative of z with respect to v then you would have to determine, uh, multiply just as before the derivative of z with respect to y with the derivative of y with respect to x. But then additionally you multiply uh, together or you additionally multiply the derivative of x with respect to v. So that's what the chain rule is and how it generally works. And let's now look at an example. But for simplicity let's just use those two functions and since we're gonna need uh, the functions for the derivative of those functions let's write them out and they look like this so nothing special going on here and now let's say x is equal to 2 in that case y would be 3 times x so 3 times 2 minus 2 which is then 4 and z is y squared so 4 squared which is 16. And those steps, so to say, resemble the feed forward. And now if you want to determine the derivative of z with respect to x, when x is equal to 2, then you, so to say, have to move backwards. And therefore, we first need the derivative of z with respect to y, evaluated when y is equal to 4, because if x is 2, then y is going to be 4. So in that case we then have to multiply 2 times y, so 2 times 4, which is 8. And then in the next step we have to determine the partial derivative of y with respect to x, evaluated at the point when x is equal to 2. And here actually it wouldn't matter what value x is because the derivative of y is always 3. So now you simply multiply together those two numbers and this gives us then a derivative of 24. So if we would increase our x by a tiny amount then z would increase by 24 times that amount. And now just as a side note just to show that the chain row really works if you would put in the formula for the y into z then you get this equation and if you multiply it out then it looks like this. And then uh, if you want to determine the derivative of z with respect to x. This looks then like this, or the formula looks like this. 
And then if you want to know the derivative of z with respect to x when x is equal to 2, then you simply multiply 18, 18 times 2 minus 12, which is again 24. So we get the same result as we had with the when we used the chain rule. So the chain rule really works. And now going back to our overview graphic, we can use the chain rule to very easily determine those two partial derivatives. So we actually don't need this complicated formula anymore. So now let's start with the partial derivative of the mean squared error with respect to weight matrix 2. Here we have to first determine the partial derivative of the mean squared error with respect to O out. This we multiply with the partial derivative of O out with respect to o, o in. And then finally, we multiply those two partial derivatives with the partial derivative of O in with respect to weight matrix 2. And just to be clear, here we are using the partial derivative again because we are always determining the derivative uh, with respect to a matrix. And a matrix contains many variables and not just one. Okay, so now let's determine the partial derivative of the mean squared error with respect to weight matrix 1. And therefore, again, we have to first determine the partial derivative of the mean squared error with respect to O out, and then the partial derivative of O out with respect to O in. So those first two steps are actually the same. But now to get uh, to the weight matrix 1, we have to uh, keep going through those equations. So we are next multiplying those two expressions with the partial derivative of O in with respect to H out. And this we then multiply with the partial derivative of H out with respect to H in. And then finally, we multiply that with the partial derivative of H in with respect to W uh, weight matrix 1. So that's how we can determine those two partial derivatives. So the third and final element that we are going to need to determine the right parameters for the deep learning algorithm is the chain rule. And now all those three elements taken together are what make up the backpropagation algorithm. And with that, we could now finally start to implement that. But before we do that, we have to make one more adjustment. Namely, we have to modify our activation function, so the step function here. And that's because the step function is actually not differentiable when x is equal to 2. And that's because of this step here. And what it means is that we can determine uh, the derivatives of those functions here. So we can determine the partial derivative of O out with respect to O in and the partial derivative of H out with respect to H in. So we can't actually determine how we should update our weight matrices. And even if the step function would be differentiable, despite this uh, step here, then we still couldn't use it because as you can see in this graph, the slope is always zero. So in the context of our chain rule, we would multiply those other partial derivatives with zero, which means our update for the weight matrices would also be zero. So we wouldn't actually update them. So now to get around this problem, what we need is a different activation function, a function that doesn't have such a step and a function that doesn't has a, have a slope of zero. And this function is going to be the sigmoid function. And for now, we're not really interested in the actual formula of this function, but we are more interested in its shape. And as you can see, both functions look relatively similar to each other. The step function is only uh, shifted slightly to the right, but that's only because we arbitrarily set the threshold level to two. If we set it to zero, then it gets shifted to the left. And now both functions basically look the same. For large negative values, the sigmoid function also returns a zero or almost a zero. And for large positive values, it returns almost a one. And in between that, there's a smooth transition. So the sigmoid function is actually differentiable at all points. And the slope of this function goes from almost being zero to 0 
25, uh, 0 0.25, which is uh, the biggest slope or the highest value for the slope of this function. And then the slope goes back again to almost being zero. So this is now uh, the function that we're going to use as our activation function. And going back to our overview graphic, we can now replace the step function with the sigmoid function. And then accordingly, the neural net is not going to output either a zero or a one, but instead it's going to output any value between zero and one, zero and one excluded. And with that now, we can finally start uh, to implement the backpropagation algorithm. And this will be the topic of the upcoming video. So thanks for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next video.